Hello and welcome. I am Raziel and I, today I have a very special guest, Maka from the Outer Circle. You probably know him from his Horace Heresy series. Um, hello. G'day. How are we? Uh, not too bad. So you do a lot of Horace Heresy videos. Um, so what uh, got you? So I've been told. Yeah. So what got you into war gaming and you know the whole forty k thing in general? Um, I actually had a relative who went over to England in the 90s, early 90s, and bought me back a Games Workshop figurine. And uh, to this day, my family still says, what a mistake that was. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can understand that. <laughs> um, do you remember what figurine it was? Uh, it was a high elf mage. Nice, nice. I remember those. I'm so old. So <laughs> you get called salty a lot. Uh, I don't understand it. I think you tend to be very honest, and you—I mean, you—you you tell what you you think's true and what you know what you see. So, do you think there's like this disconnect with people thinking that if you're honest, that is overly negative, would be you know salty? Do you think there's like a disconnect there? Um, there's definitely a disconnect, but I think in part where that disconnect comes from is that people, people are really passionate about the game. They've sunk a lot of time, money, whatever it might be into the game. They're committed to it. I think they see it as a critique of them personally, when you critique the game or the company, whichever it might be, as opposed to being able to sort of step back and examine it logically and go, okay, maybe there are some things here that are, you know, less than ideal in how the company, you know, conducts their business. Mm. And this is very bizarre to me because, like, we'll, we'll critique movies, you know, we'll critique media to no end. Look at the savaging that, you know, Star Wars has taken in the last few years. And it's all good and well to critique that stuff, but we somehow draw a, a line at Games Workshop, like, that's the sacred cow, you know, We'll, we'll critique everything when it comes to politics, to religion, to movies, to holidays, to cars. Uh, but for some reason, when it comes to Games Workshop, the minute you, you sort of have a go at it, people always find, you know, new and interesting excuses to defend it. I've never quite understood it. Now, you're very consumer driven. And your channel is very consumer driven. I try to be consumer driven as well, but I think we come up from two different points. I come from a financial point, like how to build an army cheaply. Not it might necessarily be a good army, but it'd be an inexpensive army. You tend to go more rule settled. You know, like you look at how it reacts on the table rather than you know how much it costs it overall. What what would be the best way for, say, someone who's coming into Horace Heresy? Would you say it would be the finance? Uh, what would be the best way you would say for them to start the hobby? What I wanted to say. Well, I think for me personally, I cover a lot of stuff related to rules because I try and encourage people not to make strong and overpowered lists, but to make lists that are viable. Okay. Mm. And nothing more than that, just viable. So they've got to be able to be equal or on par with their peers in some capacity. If they're not on par with their peers in some capacity, then you're setting yourself up to probably lose games. And as much as people like to say, oh, I don't care if I win or lose, I think deep down in human psyche, we kind of do care if we win or lose. And if you lose enough... Yes? Hello? Uh, I think we've lost you there. It's a... Oh, well, we seem to have a difficulty. Uh, hold on a second. Oh. Still going. There you go. Yep. So I, I try and encourage people to purchase miniatures, assuming that people have limited funds. They need to purchase miniatures, in my mind, that are just going to be viable. Um, so doing that cheaply, ideally, but 
if it costs a little bit more, so be it, so long as the end result is something I think they can get the most bang for their buck out of. No, oh, that sounds fair enough. Uh, I'm an outdoor player, so losing hasn't been something I've been known to do. <laughs> um, so that's, yeah. So, yeah, that makes sense. I can understand that point of view. So, obviously, we see Games Workshop pushing meta a lot, you know, and we see the meta chasing and all of that. How does that How does that feel for you when you see people just chasing the powerful army, the big army, really what's big, what's popular now? Um, geez, that's a, that's a tough one because a lot of it comes down to why, why are they chasing the meta? Hmm. Is it because everyone around them has gone that direction and therefore in order to be on par with their peers, that's the way they've gone, or are they chasing the meta because they're power gaming? They're, they you know, and they're the ones leading the community in that direction. You know, they're two opposite ends of the spectrum and if they're power gaming and trying to lead the community in that direction, especially if it's against the wider community in their area's uh, will, then it's a bad thing. But if it's, uh, to me personally, if it is being done because, um, you know, they're just trying to keep up with the Joneses, as it were, and try and keep enjoying their hobby, and it's just the goalposts are being moved on the wall, that's unavoidable. So that's really the way I sort of see that. No, I understand that. That makes sense because obviously, like you said, like you get tell you you get people say that they don't they like, don't care if they win or lose, but deep down we're not going to go to the tabletop and go, yeah, I'm just going to lose this. You, we're going to go out and we're going to do our best. We're going to try and win, no matter what we're playing. <laughs> right. So, um, what? So, do you play anything outside of the Games Workshop range? I do actually play quite a few games out of their range, especially uh, Cool Media Not games. Oh, yeah. Um, so I've got, obviously, A Song of Ice and Fire. I also have Chronicles of Hate, uh, Unk, Gods of Egypt, uh, Battletech, Drop Zone Commander, um, a few other little games as well on the shelf. But that's probably my main sort of games that I prefer to play. Well, that reminds me, Battletech came has been doing pretty well lately. It was, what, number three or number two in the top ten tabletop games? Well, how yeah, it has really seen a resurgence, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. Um, so I've actually made a video about how Battletech's quite important because it, it predates Epic. It's one of the earliest games. So how would you compare Battletech to what you've seen with Epic? I'm not saying that's a silly name. <laughs> um i know exactly what you're referencing there yeah legion imperialis the well i think Tit titanicus actually the new version i think borrows a lot of mechanics from uh from um battle tech uh in the way that like damage is allocated and such that's very very battle tech in my opinion and i think the you know, that was a good move. I think having more complex games with better mechanics is ideal because Games Workshop's mechanics, especially the last few years, have been all over the place and a very dumbed down, I think, uh, to sort of a hero hammer sort of yeah. game. Uh, so that move was really positive. But in regards to Epic, well, you can play with Battletech miniatures from the 80s. Yeah, and I heard that a lot. Yeah, they're still perfectly viable in the current, you know, meta, quote-unquote, as it were. Um, you cannot do that with Games Workshop and Games Workshop's version of Epic because they've changed units, added units, changed scales, you know, changed the base types, whatever it might be. And uh, the idea of if it ain't broke, don't fix it doesn't seem to be understood at Games Workshop because... They come in with a game like Epic and they have a really good working system in Epic Armageddon. Uh, you know, if opinions will vary on which is the best version, but they don't just try and re-release that version and see how it floats with the community, like a relatively balanced, relatively FAQ'd version. Hmm. Instead, they tinker with things. Hmm. You know, it's like the writers almost remind me of like an obsessive compulsive person, like they see a smudge on the bench 
oh, I better wipe that and clean it. And they wipe it and the smudge is still there and they keep wiping it. Got to clean it, got to clean it, got to clean it. It yeah. seems to be the way that they, they write their rules in that they take the things that work and they just sort of discard them in favour of being able to say, we wrote new rules. Uh, and that's what concerns me is that this epic is not going to be one of these um, one of these versions like in the past where it's like we can take this existing uh, stuff, this existing game and build on it. No, no, we're going to create a new thing from the ground up and any problems that that contains, well, frankly, based on their track record, they're not going to try and fix those problems. They're just going to leave it to sit there for months rotting before they FAQ it. Yeah, I've noticed that a lot with some of our games. Now... <laughs> This is the thing that worried me. Like when Epic was announced, um, I remember when Epic 40k came out, I still got an old white dwarf, which actually has Space Marine as an advert. <laughs> and see, I was always thinking, why didn't they release Battlefield Gothic? Battlefield Gothic still has a massive following. It actually, and I ended up looking at it, has the longest run of any game or a game edition Games Workshop has ever released. What made you think they didn't go down the Battlefield Gothic route, seeing as you know, for Horus Heresy, we've not seen many Void Wars, and it would have really opened that up if it went Horus Heresy route. So what do you think they went? Wow. Epic? That's a that's a great question. So I'm an old school Battlefleet Gothic player. Well, that was the first system that I built a full army for, a full faction for, okay? Um, so it's really near and dear in my heart. And I have multiple fleets to this day in that game system. And when they bought out Battlefleet Gothic Armada, the uh, video game, I thought, yep. wow, what a perfect time for them to bring out a tying game. And especially they did. Had this, sorry, like I was going to especially now that it's actually <laughs> had a decent sequel. Like it's one of the few, you know, 40k games that's actually had a sequel that's not Dawn of War. Yeah. And they're good games, they're enjoyable games. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that I liken Games Workshop to a ship, it's mm -hmm. a big, like, oil tanker of a company. And it's got a tiny, tiny little rudder. And if you know anything about ships, it's like big ships, they don't like stopping and they don't like turning. No. It's just all that inertia. You know, when you've got a 100,000-ton oil tanker, she doesn't exactly turn on a dime. That's Games Workshop, the company. Hmm. A adaptive company, uh, a company that thinks quick on its feet with really good marketing teams and really good business management, they would look at it and go, hmm, We've licensed out this game. This developer is on track to release this game in, you know, X, Y, or Z year. Let's have a tie-in tabletop system and hopefully get some cross-pollination because if someone plays that game, they've never played a Games Workshop product before, they might really like it and they want to come play on the tabletop. We'll have the miniatures there ready to go. Strike while the iron is hot. Vice versa, someone who plays our tabletop games, if there's a... In, a PC game, for example, or a console game that they can also, you know, play. Maybe it's a it's a parent, for example, and they've got kids who are interested in the hobby, but they don't want to, you know, pay for an army for them yet or something. Uh, great, they can they can go and buy this digital product, and we'll get a percentage of that because of the licensing agreement. Like this is a win win situation, right? This yeah. this is me thinking uh, back at the outer circle thinking logic, yeah. right? Uh, to me, that is just common sense, that you would have a tie-in to occur simultaneously. And again, strike while the iron is hot. They don't do that, though. They yeah. sit for years on something, uh, something that a good example of that will be the old world, okay? Um, oh, yeah. So you have massive success, Total Warhammer, and then oh, oh, let's just say success with Total Warhammer. Total Warhammer 2 drops to huge success so yeah. successful and was making creative assembly so much money that they are still were still getting its support even into total warhammer 3 existing they were still putting support into total warhammer 2 and they'd abandoned games like britannia three kingdoms all these other games that had come troy that had come after uh, warhammer 2 because it was so popular they were devoting their efforts to that game where was the old world to tie into it yeah, I was gonna know. I noticed that, like, I rem like back then, I was actually a games journalist. I know I it was a dark time of my life, <laughs> and so I, <laughs> and when like when the you know the Tomb Kings DLC dropped, it was everywhere, 
And I was thinking, if I was Games Workshop right now, I would announce Tomb Kings because it has a big following online. I know a lot of people who, because I played Tomb Kings when I back in the Warhammer Fantasy days, and I know a lot of people who still said we want new Tomb, King, Tomb Kings models. And I was thinking, right, like, this would have been a good, good time to do that. And it kind of always seemed weird, like when they did that, and Games Workshop just kind of ignored it. It just seemed a bit weird to me. And like you said, Total Warhammer has taken over creative assemblies. I mean, not long before that, you had Total War, which was a, t- a total Rome war, Rome, which was a complete travesty. Did you play that? Uh, yeah, I did have Rome too, actually. Uh, but I got into it not straight away. I I delay on a lot of games these days unless all of my friends are playing them. Uh, because I'm so uh, aware of bad business practices, I've basically got no trust left for corporations at this point. No, I understand that. Um, I'm the same. Like I, <laughs> the only time I ended up getting Battlefield Gothic for the PC because right, the Wharf were giving it away. Uh, that was the only time I got into it. But yeah, as makes I'm... sense. <laughs> but no, to to speak to that, I I think you're um, you know. Old World is a great example because they still haven't released it. Early next year, right? I think about February, I've been told it's coming out, uh, maybe March, because the their quarterly release schedules that Games Workshop has, the, I think that's the window they're dropping it in. Yeah. And how much effort are they putting into it? Well, not an awful lot. <laughs> they're releasing, re-releasing old Bretonian models that... I remember when many of them came out and most of that range dates from about 2001, 2002 sort of era. Yeah. I still have the army book. Same, same with the tomb Kings, right? Mm. So that was when they bought back the tomb Kings, uh, cause they discontinued them in Warhammer fantasy. Cause they used to be part of the same army book as the vampire counts. Yeah. Quick history lesson for those who may not be aware. <laughs> Sorry if I bore the viewers, uh, but they, they, Bought them back because Kemri, as we know it, wasn't exactly like that. They had mummies, which are part of the vampires faction, uh, but they bought them back. And now they're bringing back all of those old miniatures, but with a few new sculpts, you know, a couple of new units, uh, new heroes mainly for those two factions. And that's going to be the this is the the get into Warhammer fantasy force. How much effort does that really require, especially when you have 8th edition Warhammer Fantasy rulebook already written? Why why is this a three, four-year development cycle since they announced they're bringing back the old world? This shouldn't be a three, four-year project. This should be a three-month project. They're talking about... Because it does not take that long to create... You know, when, when all the groundwork is there, miniatures already exist, apart from a few character sculpts, which are, they're making them in resin anyway at Forge World here. So it's not like they're, um, you know, it's not like they're, they're making these long lead time items in plastic injection molding dies. They're a couple of resin characters, you know. And because they've already got the rules written, all they have to do is, you know, build upon 8th edition Warhammer Fantasy unless they want to reinvent the wheel which they probably will do but with that in mind you say well well how come it's taking so long you yeah, talking about that does did it not feel a bit weird to you that like with horse heresy they're going from resin to plastic we got the Sarasus knights the the fire from dreadnought we you know the creators all that stuff's going from resin to plastic but for some reason the old world they decided to go from plastic to resin it seems really bizarre doesn't it um, yes. I think, I think it's just a gimmick. That's, that's all that really comes to, to my mind is that it's a sort of gimmick for them in that, you know, we're, the old world will be as popular as it is, regardless of how we, um, you know, sort of act as a company. Yeah. And I don't know. See, I was like, one of the biggest arguments for Games Workshop I see is that they are, their models are the best looking, they have the best sculpts. And with what I've seen with Epic, a lot of the tank tracks look, I say doughy, like it's made out of plastic, it looks really rounded and soft and it looks doesn't look right. And then like I play Wild West Exodus and then I look at some of those models, I'm thinking, how are people, because I, do you, 
sorry, this is this is my stat. I do apologize. Do you think people are unaware that other games or other models exist? Are just so intrigued with Games Workshop, or do you think that people are starting to expand outside now? Um, I think people definitely expanded outside. Like, th there's no way that they 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 can't at this stage, really, because yeah, it's it's a really unique situation we find ourselves in, right? Where there are so many competitors. There's almost a market saturation happening at the moment. Oh yeah, and in fact, it's not an almost. It is a market saturation, and for some, this is this is perfect. You know, like oh wow, we can um, you know play so many different titles. But of course, the problem is, is that now you're diluting the player base because well, okay, you've got all these different titles out there, but who's playing it with you? Yeah, I find that's the biggest problem. I, uh, I, like you say, you play other things like uh, Ice and Fire. You mentioned a couple of games that I did not have heard of. Like, uh, do you ever find it more difficult to play something that's not Games Workshop? Like with your friends? I, I find it incredibly difficult. It's mostly down to geography, though. If I have friends come over, they're happy to try alternate games. You know, oh, yeah. we know we know we're going to have fun. It's it's those. I think for people who don't have the network, like I'm lucky, I have a really good network. And I've got an area dedicated to playing games, especially in, in the new house that I've built. Mm. I've built this big, you know, gaming shed and such. Nice. But not everyone has that. And because they don't have that, um, you know, finding people to play, it can be an impossibility for some. Mm. And, and that's really to the detriment of everyone because, unfortunately, there might be a great game out there, but it just can't you know, can't find ground, can't make a name for itself because it's just being lost in the swarm of, uh, in the, in the, just the swarm of content that exists currently in the world. Yeah, I, I agree. We do. I mean, I see a lot of people tend to go towards a single company and play many of those games rather than going, you know, playing across the board. Now, Mantic have announced uh, that they're releasing Warpath next year for Kickstarter. Do you know anything about Mantic? I do, I do. Um, Mantic, I think, was founded by Alessio Cavatora, who wrote uh, a lot of 6th and 7th edition Warhammer Fantasy um, and all of that sort of era of books. Yeah, he's a damn good, he's a very good rule book writer. No, he, I found out he didn't actually found Mantic. They, that, they that started him. and they freelanced him to write the rule books. And they sort of like, Every time they want a new rule book, I think they just give it. They like give him first refusal. If you know what I mean. But has this happened again? Yeah. Hold on. There you go. Yeah, Mantic, as you were saying, at least you could help. Was really good for him, as you were saying. Yeah, and the the funny thing with Mantic is that they're a decent system, but I think there's there are people who are like, "Yep, cool. You've got a system that's." sort of based on old school Warhammer fantasy, like, you know, Kings of War specifically. Um, but that that is too close to home. It hurts, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so they just refuse to play it because they would rather just play their old fantasy miniatures or, mm. you know, whatever it might be. There's, there's a degree of that in there, which has made it harder for Mantic. But the thing that that upsets me about the situation is that Mantic shouldn't be kickstarting. Cool Mini or not shouldn't be kickstarting. None of these companies should be kickstarting. Kickstarting should be being used as a, um, you know, small games companies, startups. That's the appropriate use of Kickstarter, not an established company. All these companies are doing is they're just removing the risk. Yes. Themselves. And that's not right. They've, they've got the, they should have the financial overhead to be able to take a chance on something. Um, and that's something I have to applaud Games Workshop for. At least they finance in-house. They haven't gone out and kickstarted yet. Um, I believe actually Mantic gave their customers the choice on this one uh, because when they announced Warpath, they literally said, we, do you want us to release it fully? Like, are you going to buy it? You might buy it. Uh, do you, would you... Do you want us to release it fully? Do you want us to kickstart? They, I believe it actually gave their customers the choice 
Um, whether or not we, you know, you never know the results of these polls anyway. Um, so this is something that you talk about a lot, and something I actually agree with you on is that there seems to be a when it comes to big games workshop, they don't seem to listen to the customers. Uh, I the when I go into like a Warhammer shop, I find that the actual staff members are pretty good, but like when it comes to the big decisions, what do you think Games Workshop's pro, uh, issue is when they just listening to you like? The smaller guy, you know, the regular customer like me or you. Um, I think they think we're idiots, and they're probably not far off the truth. <laughs> That's true. Uh, because look at the spending habits, mm. for example, of the average, you know, consumer. I don't like the oh, word yeah. consumer. It takes a lot of um, agency away from us, but. There are products that are just anti-customer, anti-consumer, and they get gobbled up. Oh, yeah. All these limited edition FOMO releases they do that just fly off the shelves. If you know that you have a captive audience who's going to do that, why do you need to go any way to impress them? Oh, exactly, exactly. I mean, you, you see on Facebook as much as I do, you see these people saying, look at my pile of shame, and it gets like a 100 likes, all these reactions, and you sit there like going, well, congratulations you, you you can spend money you know um now this comes to what i was talking about beforehand is like with youtube and them sort of more promoting the positive youtubers do you think that's ever going to bite them in the ass yes certainly um if you know that youtube is going to give a favorable review every time why would you go to them for a review mm -hmm. yeah oh i see i've seen like when i've seen People, when they say, oh, this was given to me by Games Workshop, I straight away just turn off. It's like, okay, I know this isn't good. I know this is it's not going to be a good review. It's going to be pandering. Um, one of my biggest issues with the last edition was the World Eater Codex. Um, did you see Did you see the World Eater Codex? Sadly, yes. Now, how surprised would you, tell, would you be if I told you it was the same size as the Space Wolf Supplement? Oh, not at all surprised, but you can tell how big a codex is going to be based off the amount of miniatures available in that range. Yeah. So, but so one of my big so like like I said, I used to review games, and if I was to review that book, and you probably would do the same, you would probably complain about that. You know, it's a thirty-five pound book for the same size as a seventeen pound fifty book. So, do you think they should start like if you take the Aldari book from last edition and how thick that was? And then take it, you know, compare it to all of the um, chaos ones. Do you think they should be doing more to actually put something in the codices, to, as you know, more content, just to fill it out, even if it has less miniatures, like more lore or you know, stuff like that. Um, like with anything, I think I like to try and think I'm a voice of reason. Yeah. In that my um. I'm able to think from both ends of the spectrum, the customer and the company. And from the customer, uh, customer's perspective, it's like, what an awful deal, right? But from Games Workshop's perspective, what are we going to sell you next edition if we give you everything now? Hmm. Yeah, I so, understand that. So that's the, that's the problem I see with, with what's being done with the World Eaters hmm. is that book... I mean, realistically, they, they shouldn't be their own supplement. What should happen is there should be a book called Chaos Legions, and mm -hmm. it's exactly that. It's the the sort of nine trader legions of chaos. There you go. Well, not again. Yeah, we're good, we're good. Oh, you mean like... They should, they should Right, sorry, after you. Yeah, no, it was, there should be a book called Chaos Legions, and all of the different Chaos Nine Renegade Legions should be in that. A book mm -hmm. called Renegades, which should be like a Trader Guard and Trader Space Marine chapters, mm -hmm. and then a book which is Chaos Demons. Yeah, and that's your that's your Chaos realistically sorted in an, in a perfect world, mm -hmm. and. That allows you to sort of fill them out with generic Legion units, but also specialist Legion in specific units, 
right? Almost like the way that the Horus Heresy works. You have, here's generic units that everyone can use, like Chaos Space Marine Legionnaire. And then it's like, okay, but you're picking corn, so you get access to corn berserkers, and they yeah. get added to your possible options. Uh, and that should be an elite, higher points cost, stronger force versus a renegade chapter. We should have different war gear, and, you know, it's it's the weaker force of the two. Yeah, I was going to say, because one of the things I do like about Heart of is the Lieber buffs, the Lieber Mechanicum, Lieber, you know, all of those, is because, you know, all of the legions are there. I don't have to buy a book for my Blood Angels and a book for my Thousand Sons. Well, I do have to buy a book for one, but you know what I mean. Like, I don't have to, if I do Iron Wars and Thousand Sons, I don't have to buy two separate books. And I think you're right. I think with Chaos, they should do that. I think it was a good idea. Um, I mean, they, it's something they ran for years and years and years. Even uh, with the last co co <laughs> Codex Chaos Space Marines, the fact you had to buy the World Eaters Codex to play World Eaters, you know, Corn Berserkers, really uh, uh, chafed with me. Um, talking about books, uh, I messaged you about um, Volgrim and the, bat the Exemplary Battles book. Um, how did that like that upset me because I was going to get that book, but I thought it would be unfair if I bought it because I'm not getting Fulgrim, and you know someone getting Fulgrim would be without the rules. How did that? How did you react to that when you thought that? Uh, in in what context? Uh, that the book became limited edition. It wasn't announced as a limited edition because I double checked that several times. But you know, then it suddenly Fulgrim came out, and it was all of a sudden limited supplies. Yeah, so in that situation, you, you're paywalling and limiting something that is locking away core content. Mm. Core content should never be limited edition sort of stuff. Like you yeah. have a model like Demon Forum that you're planning on selling long term, though, though limiting something that is locking away core content. Mm. core content should never be limited edition sort of stuff like you yeah. have a model like demon forum that you're planning on selling long term though, though i swear to god uh, oh my head I said... fire. wait do you want to say that again sorry so core content to a game should never be locked away. If you're keeping something around long term, it needs to be exactly that. It needs to be available long term. So Demon Forum, his rules, if they're there, then they're intending for him to be sold for a long time, people need access to it. Yeah. Now, didn't you it know, seem weird that... If, if they cannot get it... Yeah, go on. I think it didn't seem weird that Fulgrim didn't get 40k rules as well. I mean, he's like the only to be just specifically Horus Heresy as well. Well, in Fulgrim's case, again, it's think like a, a cynical company. They want to milk a 40k demon Primarch down the line. Oh, yeah. Giving him rules now that is antithetical to the way they think bringing See, rules out for him in 40k would be a fantastic gift to the players and make people really happy but what does it make them as a company see that's what i was thinking see what i would do is in this situation like like i said we i said i'm more uh, financially minded i would say if i was gw I went oh we've got 40k rules and then when they drop Fulgrim for 40k okay Oh, you didn't get him? Look, now you can get him cheaper for 40k, you know. And Forge World still sells. Like, it's, they're, they're still selling for Horus Heresy because they've already said that things like, you know, several tanks have been removed from 40k and Horus Heresy only. They could have done it that way. Well, I think in Fulgrim's case, I mean, they would have to write rules for him for 40k. Then how do they release those rules into the wild? Free in White Dwarf, I guess. But then if you don't get that White Dwarf, how do you get his rules? Do you have a data card that you uh, put in every 
blister pack of Fulgrim that you sell from Forge World? Do you put a free PDF up online that's hidden away somewhere in the vaults of Warhammer community where nothing's ever found again? Um, you know, there are many different approaches one can take, but every one of those approaches is work. Yep. And this company has consistently demonstrated, for better or worse, they don't like work. <laughs> they <laughs> like bare minimum effort. See, that's the other thing. Like, like we were talking about Mantic and other games. Like a lot of these other games give out their rules for free and not just, you know, the tools, like the full books. And, you, and Mantic's one of the things I like about Mantic is that they give out the army lists. So, like, you don't have to buy anything on top. Do you think Games Workshop should start going down that route, seeing that's what everyone else is doing? They definitely should. They should have gone down that route years ago because my personal opinion is that Games Workshop's on borrowed time mm -hmm. as far as producing miniatures because they're not the greatest miniatures in the world. They cost too much. The competition that's out there, if people like it, they'll never come back to Games Workshop. Right, there are that many people who tell you, like, I've went to Battletech and I've never looked back. So, what they need to do is they need to impress the customer now. Oh, yes, because 3D printing coming along, as well as other competition, like, they can't keep producing miniatures the way they are indefinitely. And mm. I mean, I think there's a there's probably 20 years of life left in them, mm. uh, unless there's some really, really rapid advances in consumer 3D printing technology. But See, as, as, as it stands, once that happens, what is Games Workshop going to have to keep us wanting to go to them as a company beyond rules? Because they screwed us for years and years and years and an alternative comes along. Mm. And it's like, you get to play all the Games Workshop miniatures you want and you just 3D print whatever you want whenever you need it. All they have left is rules at that point. Yeah, You mentioned, I think it was about, I think it was either earlier this year or it was a while ago that if Games Workshop started selling, you know, STLs, that would help them a lot. Mantic have started doing that. They got the Mantic Vault where they sell STLs of certain miniatures, and they also give you the opportunity to make them and sell them as well. Would that be a good idea for other companies like Games Workshop to do as well? It would be a fantastic idea for Games Workshop to do because, again, if you have a captive audience as Games Workshop. So if you start selling them you know, miniatures now as 3D STLs, when the printing revolution happens, people are just going to keep coming to you because they know you, they trust you, you know, your site isn't full of malware, whatever it might be, right? Um, they, they could even get wise to the game and say, hey, here's the recommended 3D print settings. Like, you don't have to do anything. You literally just download the model, put it into your printer, and just hit the go button. It'll work every time, hmm. you know, barring hardware issues. Um, they can generate a lot of goodwill and get customers really interested in them as a current company. But the route they're choosing is that we can injection mold plastic indefinitely. Mm. And uh, what is there uh, to keep people's loyalty? Oh, yes, exactly. Now, one thing about Games Workshop and Warhammer always is the law. That's what drives a lot of people towards them. A lot of people like the law, the books. Um, you've been playing since the 90s. I've been playing. We've, we've been both been since the 90s. Uh, do you think they've lost some of our like, grim dark edge since then? Uh, they have. More so in that they just don't explore it as much. Mm -hmm. uh, you can always find an example. You can cherry pick an example to say, look, this is still grim dark. Oh, yes. But they don't go out of their way to write and show it anymore, at least not in a way that's not grim dirt. No. So there was always a sense of hopelessness, especially in that sort of third edition 40K era, oh, a yeah. sense of, you know, chaos will come along and this planet is doomed and there is no Imperial hero coming to save them. It is just doomed. Now everything gets, you know, Almost everything. I have to be careful with my words here because people will, will jump on here <laughs> for any little indiscretion. But it's, it's almost a sense of everything gets wrapped up at the end of a story with, with you know, there is hope in the future type wrapping up. Yeah, I've noticed that. Because uh, um, do, do you remember when Apocalypse first came out? Yes. If, if there was a, like, a campaign 
in it and it was talking about Abaddon and this is what sort of struck home for me is that this was when Abaddon like if he was on the planet and they like couldn't capture him or kill him that planet was just that was going to be exterminatus down then that if they were going to kill him they're going to just take the planet with him he was that much of a danger and now he seems to be you know more of a, a nuisance than anything else and I also like you said there's there's no more of that hopelessness um like uh, if you I don't like the Imperial Fists because they kind of exemplify this, that all the Imperial Fists will die, but they still win the day. But that doesn't really mean much. If they all died and, you know, if they still lost, then you feel something. How do you, what do you think about that sort of thing? Um, well, it's, so you're asking a very complex question here. Oh, I'll break it up. Like, um, what I mean in like... a good way, though. In, in... <laughs> so the setting, the setting needs antagonists mm. and stakes that mm. are effective. I think this is true of every setting. Mm. If the bad guy in your setting is built up to be this big bad and then the heroes come in and they just knock the crap out of them ten ways to Sunday, mm. there's no stakes. No. If there's no stakes, what's the investment? Mm. What is the investment in the setting at that point, you know? Um, that's what I think when it comes to all of this. So like if if chaos are meant to be these big bads, how come they're, you know, they've got the worst equipment, mm. they've got worse options, they've got worse stat lines, even mm. the God-boosted specialist units, mm. Yeah. Are often worse stat lines than the loyalist counterparts, and you get they want to insist on telling me that chaos is this you know impossible, unfathomable threat. Hmm. Well, it can't be both at the same time, can it? No, so there, there's a real problem in the settings right there. Oh, yeah, like, um, if you look at the fall of Cadia, uh, if you remember back to fifth edition, Aldrad killed himself to stop a Blackstone fortress. And that was the end of it. Of course, they retconned that so Abaddon could have the win. In my opinion, what they should have done is kept that, but have Abaddon destroy another Blackstone Fortress just to kind of show off that, look, I can still do this. I don't care anymore. And that would mean Aldred's sacrifice would have meant nothing. You know, and, you know, Abaddon still had the win. That would make them far more uh, fearful, uh, terrifying, I should say. Now, Chaos, I, like you said, it, they tend to be kind of... a nerfed or was kind of a joke there's very few which books that show chaos as a threat the only one i can really think of is storm of iron um what about the tyrannus do you think they should be more terrifying how would you go with the, the nids um the, the tyranids probably they and the necrons should be your most terrible sort of creatures races whatever you want to call them in the setting they're not allowed to be though because if you truly want to realize what they are thematically, you're going to break the game. Yeah. Too powerful. Yeah. So, you know, the, the solution to the problem as far as sort of games workshop has gone is we'll tell you they're a big threat and then we just won't do anything with it because we can't really afford to do anything with it. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. I mean, um, it did seem a bit funny in when you know when the Blood Angels and the Necrons um, allied. I thought that was quite funny, and I think Guy Hay did a good job showing the Necrons that yeah, we're going to ally with you because by the time we killed you and the Nids, it would have just taken up too much time when we could have just you know allied and fought the Nids. And I'm um, that's the other thing. Um, Black Library now has a lot of authors. Do you think that's yes. too many? Do you think that's too many chefs sort of situation? Um, no. I think it's fine to have a ton of authors. The problem is that they need to stick one author on one particular subject once they figure out if they're any good at it, that is, hmm. and leave them there. Don't get yeah. multiple chefs trying to work on the same dish, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Uh, I know what you get like... what we have with Perro and the Horus Heresy. You get yeah. someone who's written by John French, who is just mustache twirling Dick Darcy type villain in one scene. And then the next time you see him, he's this like thoughtful, contemplative character, you know, um, because Guy Haley's writing him. 
and he's oh, this yeah. tragic figure who only ever wanted to build great architecture and you know uh, and, and it's it's schizophrenic yeah guy hey did the best job in my opinion he but like, because he did the one thing that every author should do. He made you feel for a character for good and ill. Because at the end of the book, I despised Pertravo. You know, I thought, you know, it was like a character I absolutely hated. But the fact that Guy Haley made me do that towards a character is fantastic. And you're right, John French can be quite weird with his characters and makes it almost on the side of comical. I know, I agree. Like Horace Heresy should have been a couple of authors. Because I, I saw your video on that, and I think you're right. Like, um, you know, Dan Abnett's done, what, three novels for the last bit and all, like, massive, thick novels. Have you read any of the end of, uh, end of Death? I haven't read the last two Siege of Terror books. I've, I've read snippets and more listened to people's spoilers. Mm -hmm. um, but the Siege of Terror holds zero interest for me as a narrative. I've read most of the books in it, but zero interest. Uh, my My... Last question, actually. Um, so, <clears throat> talking about Horse Heresy, and now it's coming to an end, how do you see that's going to go with the game? Do you think the game's going to expand into the scouring, or do you think it's just going to finish at the Seat of Terror and let people play the whole Horse Heresy? How do you think it's going to end? Ooh. Um, I could see them producing books set in the scouring, but maybe not as a... a, a uh, as a single series, maybe just as occasionally we'll just release a scouring book to boost sales this month or something. Um, for the tabletop game, I think that's that's in a really funny position because um, I'm trying to think the best way to say this. So for like the tabletop game, they don't really like using the books too much as their go-to for their narratives, they like to write their own. They like to make their own special characters. They like to write their own campaigns and scenarios. And where they've headed direction-wise, like rumours are that they want to do, I say rumours, to so take them with a big grain of salt, mm -hmm. is that they want to do Beta Garmin for the next um, Legacies sort of book. Yeah. So uh, taking over from where the Siege of Catonia was. And to me, it's this horrible travesty of you've got the early heresy, you know, where everything's breaking out. That's what Forge World covered. Yeah. That first sort of year, literally the first year of the war uh, out of 13-year conflict. And we've jumped straight from that to the bloody Siege of Terror, hmm. you know, because Siege of Cthonia takes place at the same time. And, of course, we've got Demon Fulgrim and where the um, Exemplary Battles of the Age of Darkness book is. Why have we why have we done this? Why have we jumped that far in the narrative? The most interesting part of, of the whole heresy is the middle. Oh yeah. Uh, so they can do a lot with that time if they choose to. If they don't choose to do anything with it though, then well, what do you do? Oh, exactly. Because uh, I was thinking about this because I read the Garo book. And, you know, like they had the how brute there and they were talking about chimeras. And then when I was reading, like looking at the Horus Heresy rules, it's like, but there's no rules for these things. Like there's no chimeras. And like I said, when I talk about financial, I talk about building armies, I would say like, instead of getting the Basilisk, you know, the Forge World one, I'll say buy the chimera version because, you know, chimeras were in Horus Heresy. Uh, do you think this, uh, I, I said the last question was the last question, but we'll just continue on with that. Uh, do you think they... Do you think there should be more rules for, or you know, just things like the Chimera and stuff like that? Things that there were in the Horus Heresy but seems to be missing? I think that there should be. I think that's the perfect use of, you know, an exemplary battles in the Age of Darkness. That's the perfect use for one of those books. Here is an yeah. interesting, unique unit. It's just a one-off. No big faction rules, anything like that. Not, you know, what they did with the Fulgrim book recently is just the polar opposite of the correct approach because mm. they've, they've released, you know, all these rules in it. And, uh, you know, if you want to play Trade of Emperor's Children, that's where all of those those rules are for playing the Hereticus. And, and for what, really? Mm. You know, there's no... Um, you know, it's, it's not a smart use of the book because they didn't include things like the Sun Killers in there. 
which oh, yeah. is an Emperor's Children elite unit from the exemplary battles in the Age of Darkness, mm -hmm. you know, volume uh, PDFs. So you wouldn't, if you're going to do that, if you're going to introduce a whole faction, that needs to be a proper expansion to the game. You know, like I said, you could only a sized book. If mm. you're going to just introduce, here's a single unit, that's what the exemplary battles books should be. And that's where things like the Chimera and such should, you know, take sort of pride of place, as it were. All right. And yeah, that's about, yeah, I agree with you. I do agree with you. Um, yeah, that was cool. Uh, I don't know how to wrap this up because I've got to do, you know, my usual advertising shilling and all that. That's right. That okay? Go with your gut instinct. Um, no, thank you very much for coming on this early in the morning. And nice talking to you. I hope best is, of course, Maka from the Outer Circle. Subscribe to him. He's a good guy. He, I, I watch him regularly. Um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate no it. Um, <clears throat> of course, as always, there's Wayland and Games. If you wish to save up to 20% off your Warhammer and free delivery after £20 or try a different game, there's Forbidden Planet. If you like comics, folk pops and all that, there's my comics, my merchandise, all the artwork by, done by me. And Patreon, well, as always. Uh, click on one of the links. I'd rather you do that than just give me money. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Hope you will see you again soon. Goodbye.